Now, we're getting a chance to be able to conclude this series, like I talked about, and we're going to be focusing on being free to love out of vision, not history. The question that I kind of want to ask as we kick this message off is, what is vision? I mean, besides the popular character from the Marvel Avengers movies, which I really happen to really enjoy. He's got great looking skin, doesn't he, if you, if you know what I'm talking about? And also, he's a, a star of a new Disney Plus series called WandaVision. But that's not the vision I'm talking about. So what we want to do is define what vision is. And so take a look at the definition of vision up on the screen. There's really two different definitions here. It's the faculty or state of being able to see, or the second definition of it is the ability to think about and plan the future with imagination or wisdom. The second part of that definition is what we're going to be talking about today. And I think that if you were to ask some of the most successful business people in the world today, they would tell you that vision is absolutely essential to the success of their business. And that there is one absolutely key ingredient to the success of carrying out that vision as a business. Is it that the vision is clear? Yeah, that's an important ingredient to every successful vision. Is it compelling? Yeah, absolutely. It has to be compelling. But they will tell you that there's one other piece to a successful vision. And that is, it has to be shared. In other words, everyone from the CEO on down to the part-time employee understands what the vision is and understands their role in it. So, for example, Tim Cook, Apple's new CEO, this is what he has just recently stated about their vision at Apple. We believe that we're on the face of the earth to make great products, and that's not changing. We're constantly focusing on innovating. We believe in the simple, not the complex. That vision statement is what drives every Apple employee. If you were to ask them what the vision is, that's exactly what they would tell you. Because it's not just Tim Cook's vision, it's their shared vision. Everyone understands their role in it. Let me ask you, do you know what Crosswalk's vision is? Let's bring it up on the screen, and this is going to give us just a moment to reflect on this. And here's our first fill-in, by the way. So Crosswalk Church's vision is to be a church for the unchurched. This means that we desire to be, by God's grace and power, a church that unchurched men, women, and children love to attend. In other words, what we dream to be here at Crosswalk is a place of grace, a place where people can come in from all walks of life, and understand that they have a place to belong, even if they still have questions about what we believe. This is a place where we firmly believe that Jesus loves all of us so much that we want every single person, regardless of what your background is, regardless of what has happened to you, regardless of maybe the regrettable moments you've had in your, in your backstory, your history, that we want you to experience God's love and to be empowered by his love to love others. Now, by the way, that isn't just Crosswalk's vision. That's God's vision for his church. In fact, 2,000 years ago, as Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples the night before he died on the cross, he had just finished washing his disciples' feet, and then he told them, as I've done for you, so now you must do for one another. And then he goes on to explain, in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said this, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Did you catch what Jesus' vision is for his church? He made the same statement three different times. Did you catch what it is? Love one another. That's his vision. That's what he wants for us as his church, as we strive to be a church for the unchurched, as we strive to bring his life-changing, life-saving love to the unchurched in our community. That's Jesus' desire. This is also, by the way, about 30 years after Jesus spoke these words, 
The Apostle Paul then wrote a letter to a group of Christians in Rome, which is what we're going to be taking a look at in just a moment. And in that letter, as a missionary, Paul wanted to invite the Christians in Rome to share his vision to go out and preach the good news about Jesus to the rest of Europe and to Spain. And so we find that as Paul was writing this letter, it was late winter of A.D. 57, and from the Greek city of Corinth that Paul wrote these words. And what's so interesting is that for about the first 11 chapters of this letter to the Romans, Paul focused entirely on God's love for mankind. Paul focused entirely on what God has done to save us from our sins. And then in chapter 12, which is what we're going to be looking at, Paul then focuses on our response to God's love for us, how we are to love one another. And so here's, here's where we take it up. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 9. Paul wrote this, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Now let's just stop there for a moment. Notice how Paul right away focuses back on what Jesus had said in John chapter 13. This is how all people are going to know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so one of the questions that Paul wanted his, his fellow Christians in Rome to be thinking about as he was writing these words was to think about what kind of church do we want to be? What is our vision for our future? And Paul gives the answer here, doesn't he? We want to be a church that is known for love, but not any love, sincere love. And so in the spirit of Paul, this is a question we want to ask ourselves here at Crosswalk. What kind of church do we want to be as we strive to be a church for the unchurched? Here's the answer. Here's our next fill-in. God's vision for us is that we are motivated to love by his purpose instead of our past. So God's vision for us is that we are motivated to love by his purpose instead of our past. Now again, you look back at verse 9 and you'll see that, that Paul wrote, love must be sincere. What's so interesting about that Greek word that is translated sincere is that it literally means anti-hypocrisy. The Greek word, by the way, for hypocrisy means to take off the mask. I don't know about you, but this is something that I struggle, especially when I think about my past. When I think about those regrettable moments that I would just really rather not talk about, that sometimes I like to put the mask on so that you can't see the real me. And maybe some of you feel the same way. And the problem with that is that any time that we're living in the past and we're not learning from our past, any time that we're living in those moments of anger or of regret or shame or guilt or whatever it is that, that impacts us from our past, we need to understand it affects our current relationships. It does. Not only that, but it prevents us from being able to love sincerely. Because either we're afraid of what other people might think or because we're just so angry that we can't adequately love other people, whatever it may be, it impacts us negatively. To the extent that we live in the past, we miss out on living out of God's vision, out of God's purpose for us. That's, why, that's the whole reason why Paul wrote what he did when he said in the second half of verse 9, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. The first place that we can hate what is evil is hating the evil that's inside of each of us. To confess that evil, to lay it at the foot of the cross, and then to cling what is good, to cling to what is good. Clinging to what is good is clinging to God. That's what it is. God is good, right? We just sang about God's goodness. Clinging to what is good is clinging to God and clinging to the forgiveness that Jesus gives each of us because he put himself on the cross. And when we do that, that frees us to love on purpose, for a purpose. And the purpose then is to be able to continue to share that love with others. 
I'm just going to tell you, I, I just got to share with you just one real quick story of this. So a number of years ago, I came across a, a guy by the name of Dan, or uh, of Don, not Dan, not Pastor Dan, Don. And uh, Don had been away from church for about 45 years or so. And the reason for that was because he had been so mistreated and so abused by his family that he had thought there's no way there is a God who would allow me to go through what I've gone through. And by the time I met him, he was a bitter man, just destroyed his marriage, destroyed his relationships. He was just so full of hate and anger. He was, he was literally unlovable because he had let his past, his history impact him so much. Well, over the course of time, as we spent time reading the word of God together, as we spent time in devotion and prayer together, Don began to change his tune. His marriage was restored. He repaired his relationships with his children. And now he is, he is one of the pillars of the new campus that was launched at, launched at my previous church. It's just amazing to see the transformation. He is living out of God's purpose for him because he recognizes that God has redeemed and forgiven his past. That's so powerful. That's the freedom that God desires to give us. So what does freedom to live out of our purpose look like then? Paul answers that next. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. Paul says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. What's interesting is that Paul's anticipating a question on the part of, of his fellow Christians in Rome. And the, the question that he's anticipating is not only what does that loving out of God's purpose look like, but does it really work? I mean, does it really work to love like Jesus loved me? I mean, does it really? Because I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but sometimes there are some really difficult people to love in our, in our relationships, aren't there? You know, maybe it's somebody in your family. Maybe it's somebody within your neighborhood. Maybe it's somebody who's a coworker or whoever. There are just some people that are a little harder to love than others. And what's interesting is that what Paul says here, Paul anticipates that. And he says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. So in other words, keep at it. Because it's worth it. And so here's our next, here's our next fill in. God's vision for us is that we are so warmed up by his love for us that we are boiling over in our love to others, even if they are cold in how they treat us. Now, the reason why we talk about boiling over in our love to others is because of verse 11, when Paul wrote, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, the Greek word for spiritual fervor literally means to boil over. Now, I want you to think about it. Everything changes when the water temperature goes from 211 to 212, doesn't it? Because at the moment that the water begins to boil, what does it produce? It produces steam. And steam, when it is pressurized, becomes extremely powerful, doesn't it? It powers entire cities. That's the point. That when it comes to our ability to love on other people who may be cold towards us, we can't look for our strength from within. We can't look to be powered from within because we're going to fail in that love. And to the extent that we try to rely on our own strength and power to be able to put up with someone who's cold towards us, we're going to fail. No, God says, hey, listen. The more that you focus on my love, the more that you spend time reading my word, the more that you spend time in growth groups, the more that you spend time in worship, the more that you really soak in how much I love you, that's going to be like putting a pot of boiling water on a hot stove. That it takes time, but eventually God's love boils over in our lives. And notice the results. Notice what Paul says here. 
He says that we're to be devoted to one another in love, honoring one another above ourselves. And in verse 12, he says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. You know what's so cool about that word hope is it's forward focused. It's vision minded. And that we can be joyful as we anticipate the future because we know God's already there. Not only that, but we can be patient in affliction. So when we suffer in relationships with people, as we strive to continue to love on them, to continue to forgive them, to continue to foster a healthy relationship, that God will give us the strength to be patient. Just like he's patient with us. And to be faithful in prayer, to just keep talking to God about it. That's what prayer is. Because he's listening and he will answer according to his will on his timetable. Man, what what great encouragement that we have from God's word here. To be able to live out of purpose, to live out of God's vision, to love one another, to boil over in that love even when someone else is cold to us. Now, Paul then continues. Take a look at verse 13. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. You know, what's interesting is that as we read these words, wouldn't you want to be a part of a group of people like that? We think about it. This is what God wants us to be to people around us. He wants us to be able to share with those in need, to practice hospitality, which that Greek word literally means to love strangers. So, you know, when you see somebody in your neighborhood that you don't know, did you smile and say hello as you walk past each other? Or the other day, uh, there was somebody that had a broken down tire, and uh, I pulled up and, and stopped behind him and asked him if I could help. Now, he said, I'm good. He didn't accept the help, but he saw that I was, I was loving on a stranger. That's the kind of stuff that God says will, will attract people who don't know Jesus to say, hey, why are you living differently? What makes you so different? Well, the answer is love. Love one another. Live out of God's purpose, right? And then notice that um, in verse 16, he says, live in harmony with one another. And so here's our next fill in. God's vision is that each of us plays our part in harmony with one another. So God's vision is that each of us plays our part in harmony with one another. (laughs) I really wish that I could have somehow had a recording back when I was in middle school band and I played trombone And I I really wish that I could have had some sort of recording of that. I'm pretty sure there's a reason why no recording of that exists. (laughs) Just saying, okay? But I want you to picture now, if you've ever heard a middle school band, and compare the difference to a symphony orchestra. It's night and day different, isn't it? Because in a middle school band, typically for those of us who were like trombone players, we knew that we could totally overpower everybody else in the band. And it was joyful noise, just saying, right? But it was certainly not in harmony with one another. Whereas a symphony orchestra, they're all perfectly tuned. They're all on the same page, which may or may not happen in middle school band. And they're all playing different notes, but they're all in harmony with one another. And that's the beautiful picture of what God wants us to be as a church. To live in harmony with one another. To be able to celebrate the differences. To be able to celebrate that, yes, each of us has a different role to play, a different part, that each of us is playing a different note, but that together we can accomplish more in love. And that is so important because you know what that does? That we live in a culture right now that is so disunited. There's so much hatred, so much anger, so much, um, for lack of better words, filth spewing from people's mouths at each other. 
And isn't it great to be a part of a group of people that live in harmony with one another? Isn't it great to be able to recognize the differences that we have, whether it's racial or political, whatever it may be, and that we can respect each other for it and still love each other? All because Jesus loves each and every one of us. That is refreshingly different from the rest of our culture. Now, understand living in harmony requires humility. Notice that in verse 16, Paul said, Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. That Greek word for the phrase, do not be conceited, literally means to be wise in your own eyes. So go back to middle school band, picture me playing my trombone, being wise in my own eyes. You know what that was? Yeah, my trombone sounds way better than all the rest of you. And so I played it way louder. And you know what I did? I made the whole group sound bad because of how awful I was playing. No, God says, do not be conceited. Do not think that you are wise in your own eyes. Instead, be willing to associate with those who are different with you. Be willing to associate with those who are in low position. Now, why this was so particularly applicable to the Roman Christians is that understand that there was a hierarchy in Roman culture. Yeah, there were the elite people. You know, the people that were part of the Senate and part of the royalty, part of the emperor's club. There were all those people. Then there were the the Roman soldiers. Then there were the business people, the the successful business people. And then there was the rest of us. And Paul was saying, regardless of what your background is, regardless of, of how successful you may be, love one another. Live in harmony with one another. And we got to ask ourselves, are there times that I look down on other people? Are there times that I have led a life of disharmony and disunity because I don't love and respect someone who's different than me? Have I contributed to the hate in our culture? Guilty. And I think that there are times that we've all been guilty, even just within our own family at times. And so what we want to do with our pride, what we want to do with our wisdom in our own eyes, what we want to do with our ego is just lay it at the foot of the cross and humbly look up at the Lord of the universe giving his life for our forgiveness. Now, that doesn't mean that we just then go around and say, love, 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 and condone all kinds of sin out there. We don't, God wants us to be full of grace and truth, right? And so sometimes that means that living in harmony means that we actually speak the truth in love to other people. If we see that somebody is caught in a sin, we're willing to talk to them about it. Because that's the other, that's the other side of the road, isn't it? That's the other side of the ditch that we can fall into where we're just going to pretend that everybody's okay regardless of how they're living and not be willing to talk to them that that sin might impact their relationship with God forever. So living in harmony also means speak the truth in love. Now, that being said, Paul anticipates that there are going to be times where people just aren't going to get along. And and take a look at, at verse 17. He continued, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, just stop there for a second. Because there are going to be times where somebody, regardless of what you're trying to do, trying to live at peace with them, there are going to be some times where that person is just not going to take your words and actions kindly. And that person is just going to make life miserable for you and paul is saying here as far as it depends on you so do only what you can do control only what you can control try to live at peace with everyone but then he goes on in verse 19 do not take revenge my dear friends but leave room for god's wrath for it is written 
It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, like many of the Roman Christians, um, many of us have also suffered personal attacks, even from family members. Because again, remember, back in that day in Rome, many of these Christians were coming out of a very pagan family where the family was devoted to pagan idolatry the family was devoted to worshiping the emperor because that was all part of the roman culture and so as these christians began to follow jesus you want to know what happened within their families arguments over what was right arguments over how to live and so on and so many of these roman christians were tempted to retaliate rather than reconcile. Well, the same is true for you and me, right? But what God wants to reinforce for us here is that there is no one better to take care of bringing justice to a situation than he is. We are not to take matters into our own hands. We leave it in the hands of our gracious and just God. Now, the fill-in, let's just get to that next here. God has a better way than for us to try to retaliate. He has a better way. Here's our next fill-in. God's vision for our church is that we are free to love even our enemies. And why? Because love will win in the end. Now that last statement, that's a pretty bold statement. Because the reality is, is that if you look around in our world today, Does love look like it's winning? All you see are people getting worse towards each other. Hating each other, getting more violent, whatever it may be. And Jesus himself even said, the love of most will grow cold in the end. So that's a pretty bold statement to say that love will win in the end. So what do I mean by that? Well, understand that every single time that we share the love of Jesus, every single time that we continue to love someone else, even if they're cold to us, even if they're trying to hurt us, every single time that we do that, Paul quoted a proverb from the wisest man who ever walked on this earth, a man by the name of Solomon, King Solomon. And the the quote is that in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Well, what that means is that every time that I strive to be kind to someone, even if they're mean to me, is that I'm actually amplifying their evil behavior in their own eyes. If you've ever heard of the phrase, kill them with kindness, that's kind of like what Paul's saying here. That as we love on people, even if they're evil to us, that that will amplify their evil in their own eyes and possibly lead to a change in behavior. Don't believe me? Maybe the greatest example of this is what occurred at the cross when Jesus was being crucified. When Jesus was being crucified, anybody remember what he said to the Roman soldiers as they were driving nails into his hands and feet? Jesus said this, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, he certainly could have sought retaliation. After all, he was perfectly innocent. He didn't deserve to be there. But instead, he was there to give his life to bring reconciliation, not retaliation. Fast forward a few hours, and then, of course, during that time, what occurred? Remember that at the beginning of Jesus' crucifixion, at the time that they were all hung, there there were two other guys, and both of them were criminals. Both of them deserved to be there. And one of the criminals changed his tune. It was literally a deathbed confession. He repented. And what did he say to Jesus? He said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say to him? Today, you will be with me in paradise. So even this man that had been mocking Jesus, maybe just an hour earlier, at that point, came to faith in Jesus because he saw the love of Jesus in action. And then think about those Roman soldiers that Jesus had said, hey, Father, forgive them. When Jesus finally gave his life and he breathed his last, 
and there was this big earthquake that took place. And what did those Roman soldiers exclaim? Surely he was the son of God. That's the difference. That's the power of love. Now, Jesus then, his body was laid in the grave for three days. Everybody thought that love had lost. Except on that Easter Sunday, everything changed. When Jesus rose from the grave, that is proof that love wins. So let me ask you, are you tempted to give up on love? Is there somebody difficult in your life right now that you're like, you know what, I just want to sever the ties, never talk to that person again? Remember Jesus and his love for you in reconciling you to our holy God. Are you tempted to, you know, retaliate when somebody hurts you instead of reconcile with them? To speak harsh words, hurtful words back to them when they hurt you? Remember Jesus and the forgiveness that he earned for you. Do you feel powerless at times to be able to get past your history, whatever it may be? Maybe a hurt, a habit, or a hang-up that you have in your history? Remember Jesus and his history for you and his love and forgiveness in his death and resurrection for you. And this brings us to our final fill and our final thought. Jesus makes our history, whatever it may be, part of his story, which has changed our future forever. Heaven is our home. That's what we get to look forward to. That's God's vision. So the question then, who needs to hear the difference Jesus' story has made in yours? Because every single time we share the love of Jesus, people like Don, their lives are changed for now and forever. And love wins. That's God's vision. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, wow, this this message really got to me because there are so many times that I have lived out of my history, out of my past, and just let that past hurt my present relationships and has led me to hurt others. And so, Lord, forgive me and help me to live out of your vision, out of your purpose, that because my past is forgiven and because other people's pasts are forgiven, that we can love one another as we look forward to our future home in heaven. And so, Lord, make us bold. Make us to be boiling over from your love for us so that we can love others, even when they're cold to us. And bless us, Lord. Bless us in our relationships. Bless us in, our, in reaching out to our community. Help us at Crosswalk, Lord, to live out of vision, to be a church for the unchurched. And we ask all of this, Lord, in your saving name. Amen.